now it's time for the final keynote, the Joan Kerner Social Justice Oration. It's something very dear to my heart. Before our final speaker begins, I would like to take a moment to talk about Joan Kerner. Joan, as I'm sure everyone here knows, was Victoria's first female Premier and probably our most courageous social justice warrior. I was lucky enough to call her a friend and to work for her. She was a fearless campaigner for women. Joan also went into bat for education and the environment. In fact, she fought inequality wherever she saw it. Those of you who were lucky enough to meet her would understand that this focus on fairness and equality really came from Joan's deep empathy with people, all people, everyday people. And I'm sure Ron, Joan's partner in life, would attest to that. He was very much a part of that journey. We are honoured to have Ron here today. Please welcome Ron. <clears throat> This year, the theme came for Communities in Control from Joan. It was she who ordered us, she was very good at that, to get angry and then get organised, her exact words. Eight years ago, we decided to name the social justice oration in Joan's honour. Now in its eighth year, the oration has been delivered by Joan herself in 2012, as well as Uta Kretzer, Sharon Burrow, Julia Gillard, Lieutenant General Dan Morrie, Waleed Ali and Andrew Denton, and last year by Gillian Triggs. And this year, we are very honoured to add to that eminent list Professor Helen Milroy. Helen is a consultant and child and adolescent psychiatrist and Winthrop Professor at the University of Western Australia, a descendant of the Palku people of Western Australia's Pilbara region. She was a commissioner for the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse that amazing report that she worked on. She studied medicine at University of Western Australia and worked as a general practitioner as a consultant in childhood sexual abuse at Princess M Margaret Hospital for children for several years before completing specialist training in child and adolescent psychiatry. Helen is one of our finest and most eminent Australians. Please make her welcome. Thank you all for staying. I know it's the, uh, the end of the second day and it's been a long day and quite honestly I think we should have just all gone home after that last presentation. <laughs> I'm not sure I can uh, quite follow that one. But thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, I didn't actually, oh, uh, before I start, um, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And just to remind us that underneath us today, there are still thousands and thousands of years of Indigenous history. Um, I never had the pleasure of meeting Joan, but I really admired what she stood for. And I, I did start to read some of her profile, and I actually read her social justice oration as well on the website. And uh, my respects to her partner who's here today. And it sounds as it, what, what it said was that she stood, for, uh, she was courageous, ceaseless clever and compassionate, and they're really wonderful qualities in our leaders, aren't they? In fact, I was at a forum recently and I suggested that perhaps one of the KPIs for CEOs and leaders and managers and politicians could be some of those things, but in addition should be kindness. Wouldn't that be great if we had that as a KPI? <laughs> Maybe that might make a difference going forward. So where are we in society today? Uh, I'll just start my PowerPoint. Can does that come up? Great. Okay. Sorry, I had to do a PowerPoint. I know it's an oration, but I can't go anywhere without my paintings. They're like my children. So you're just going to have to indulge me in this. I'm also going to tell two stories, one at the beginning and one at the end. So Dennis is going to keep me on track because I want to have time to tell the last story. So I might have to squash the stuff in between if I run out of time. So where are we in society today? It's easy to see the problems and forget about all of the progress and success, success that we've had. And I'm certainly glad I'm a woman living in today's society compared to maybe my grandmother's time or my great-grandmother's time. And yet there are still so many problems that we have to conquer. Does anyone really think we have equity yet? Really? No, I don't think so. In fact, listening to the apology to the refugees it made me think, well, it's really not surprising, is it, that we live in such a hypocritical society? 
if you only look at what happened with Indigenous peoples in this country, Australia was founded on trauma and denial and, and a lot of cruelty to children and to people. So it's not surprising that we're repeating history. It's unfortunate that we don't learn from it and we, we often don't. The other thing that's, I think, happening in the modern world as well is that people say due to advances in technology and communication, we are now the most connected yet disconnected society ever. And if you think about that and the impact on children in regard to that, it creates a different sense of what we have to do for the future. As we know, social justice is essentially about fairness in society. It's also about how we relate to each other. And of course, we all exist in relationships with family, community and society, as well as the environment and the world at large. For me, relationships are essentially about stories, stories about creation, about life, about family. So I'm going to use stories and paintings for this presentation. I also wasn't quite sure what to speak about today, so I thought I would speak about the things I've been most passionate about in my life, and that is children, Indigenous issues and mental health, and of course all of these things can be linked together. So just by way of introduction, that X marks the spot, that's my mob up in the Pilbara there. Beautiful country, very hot, don't go in summer. Um, but you can see that that map, Aboriginal map of Australia is very different than the normal lines and maps that we see uh, represented. So it's so important to know where we come from. As well, this is my grandmother holding my mother and me holding my first child. I'm quite a bit younger then. Um, and I guess we just have to always remind ourselves that whenever we talk about social justice, we have to talk about relationships and the fact that generations are so important. So as my grandmother held my mum and my mum held me and I held, hold my children, that's, that's how life should be. Um, but is that what happens today? Is, is that what's happening in families today? Let's have a little bit of a think about where, um, where we are currently. We don't actually have a very good track record in Australia of dealing well with children and families. And that was really brought home to me um, during the five years of the Royal Commission. So first of all, I'm going to start off with just setting the scene a little bit in terms of Indigenous peoples in this country. And I'm going to tell you a story about Dingo and Moon. Dingo and Moon had been friends for as long as anyone could remember. They started off together full of joy and hope as a little pup at a new moon many years ago. Each phase of life brought different challenges. In the first phase, life was wonderful and exciting, and each night they would share their stories and laugh together. But in the second phase, Dingo had been hunted almost to the point of extinction. At times, he even had his ears cut off for a bounty of five shillings. For many years, Dingo could no longer sleep in his country. The stench of blood in the landscape kept him awake. He cried out to Moon, and Moon watched in despair. Moon tried to comfort Dingo and stay true to her word. Moon would always be there waiting for Dingo, listen to his stories, and send moonbeams to stay with him. In the third phase, things started to change. Dingo started to grow strong again, but was still scared about what might happen. He slept with one eye open, just in case. The world started to realise they needed Dingo. He had a lot of knowledge and knew how to look after country. The moon looked on with renewed hope. In the fourth, fa fourth phase, Dingo and Moon rejoiced once again. Although Dingo was very old and tired, he was at peace. He knew his children would be safe and grow even older than he was. He knew his grandchildren would remember the stories and feel proud and strong, and the whole world would see just how remarkable they are. He knew his great-grandchildren would finally be able to walk this land and be leaders among men. Dingo had found his voice again and sang a beautiful love song to Moon, thanking Moon for always being at his side. Moon had grown full and bright and lit up the landscape with a golden glow surrounding Dingo. Dingo smiled and said to Moon, finally, I will sleep like a pup again tonight. He closed his eyes for the last time and fell into a deep sleep, dreaming of happy times. Moon smiled and watched over him, just as she had done since the beginning of time. There are many ways we can think about that story. We're not in phase four yet. A lot of our mob are still sleeping with one eye open because they really don't know what's going to happen. And I think about my, my grandmother and my mother and what they went through in this country. And I think about my mother's um, 
grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and are they going to have that opportunity to be leaders amongst men? You know, I was at an international women's forum a little while ago, and we were talking about the inequities for women, and I posed a question to the men in the room. What are you so scared about if women get up into positions of power and control that the world's going to be a better place? And I wonder the same for our mob. What are people so frightened about if our mob gets up there and we become healthy and thriving and our children become leaders of men? There's nothing to fear. We have a whole industry surrounding our disadvantage. It's about time we stop that and started to use our strengths to actually thrive. I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience of the Royal Commission, only because it sets, I think, the, the way we dealt with children in years gone by. As we know, the Royal Commission um, had its terms of reference. It was to better protect children, achieve best practice in the reporting and responding to child sexual abuse, and to address and alleviate the impact of, of what happened. Did any of you see any of the public hearings live streamed or were aware of some of the stories and, and some of the institutions that we looked at? It was, it was pretty extensive. I think we were really well into the media for a, a very long period of time. People have often asked me since um, what, what was the experience like being on the Royal Commission and I have to say it was both profoundly, profoundly disturbing and incredibly inspiring all at the same time and very intense for the entire five years. I'll also pause just for a moment to say I have to pay my respects to all of the people who came forward and, and helped us with the inquiry, often at great personal cost, it took a lot of courage, um, and I was so inspired by some of their stories of survival. I often sat um, and listened to their stories and thought, I don't know if I would be here today if that had happened to me. So during the five-year inquiry, lots of people contacted us we did just over 8,000 individual private sessions as well as the ones that were in the public hearings. As you can see, we referred a lot of matters to the police. We held sessions all over the country. We went to all of the prisons as well. And I have to say, for a lot of the men in prison in particular, but the women as well, if someone had have just looked after them as children, they probably wouldn't be in jail. And I think that's just as true today as it was back then. And we heard complaints about nearly 3,500 institutions. So basically, anywhere where children are, there's the potential for exploitation and abuse. In terms of who we heard from in the private sessions, we saw a lot of men, which was unusual, because a lot of times in these sorts of inquiries, we do hear from women, and that's good, that's, that's great, but I think it's also important to hear the, the, men, the voices of men as well, and in particular, the differences in the impact that these things had on them as children and growing up to be men in, in society. We had an over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as you can imagine, because of the stolen generations and the widespread removal of children into institutions. We heard a lot about the missions. I had thought that I had understood the magnitude of what happened in this country. I really thought I had. I'd lived through it with my own family. My mother was a stolen gen, things that had happened to my grandmother and all of our ancestry. But it wasn't until the Royal Commission where I sat through so many stories of generational removal, of generational trauma. Some of the missions that we had around were there for over 100 years. How many generations of children is that? that are going through that same level of profound trauma. And then what do we do? We just shove them back into community and expect them to all be OK with very few resources um, and very little help. We systematically dismantled families and communities over generations. That's why we're in the state we're in today. And the other thing I think that was really interesting about trauma, and particularly trauma in childhood, is it often goes unnoticed and undisclosed. And in fact, for a lot of people that came to us, it was a good 20 years before they disclosed. We had some people come who were in their 90s that were disclosing to us for the first time. That's an incredibly long time for people to have to hold on to those stories. And for a lot of people, it was the first time they'd ever spoken about their story. So we didn't do very well with children back then. And these stories aren't all from the sort of 40s and 50s and 60s. These were also contemporary stories. We saw a reasonable number of, of young people who were already in, who were currently in or just out of, out of home care. If we have a quick snapshot and we look at some of the data from the AHW report, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on data. Are we, are we doing better or are we doing worse? Well, according to the AHW, we're increasing our numbers in out of home care. 
We are a really wealthy country. We know how to do things really, really well. Why is this happening? D don't we know how to bring up children well? Don't we know how to support families? I think we do. So there's something wrong if we're increasing the numbers of kids in adult care. And I feel really sorry for people working in the out-of-home care sector because they get a really bad rap. But in fact, they have one of the most important jobs in the country. They're looking after and bringing up our future citizens. In fact, I suggested that we should overfund them so that they have everything they need to make sure that every child they have to deal with has the best possible chance to recover and achieve in life. So removals are going up. The removals for Aboriginal kids are going up at a much greater rate. We're now up to 10 times the non-Indigenous rate. A few years ago, it was about six. So it's rapidly increasing. In fact, in some states, almost one in two Aboriginal families has contact with the child protection system. If we look at juvenile justice, Aboriginal kids are 25 times as likely to be in detention. And sometimes it's for really minor things, and a lot of it is about trauma and disadvantage, not about criminality. When we were looking at some of the juvenile justice systems as part of the Royal Commission, we looked at some of the models in Scandinavia. They don't lock up juveniles. They don't have a detention system like we do. They see where juveniles are, are, are having these sorts of behaviours or problems as an issue in development for the child, and they have a wraparound rehabilitative focus, not so much a punitive one. If we look at suicide rates, they're increasing as well. And for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth, depending on which community you look at, they're very high. In fact, some of the highest rates almost in the world. And the age of self-harm is getting younger. We've already, we're already aware of the family violence figures as, as well as the hospitalisations for Aboriginal women. So children are still growing up in these toxic childhoods. We can do better than that. So why are children important? Well, I think that one of the beautiful things about a child is that it brings new life. And it's so precious when you first hold your child in your arms when you've just given birth. It's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. If we can't be joyous and we can't celebrate new life, then do we value life at all? And what happens at the end of life? Are we going to give everybody, anybody any dignity at the end of their life if we can't actually ensure the healthy arrival of all of our children? And we still have issues in antenatal care. We still have issues with low birth weight. We have lots of problems still in some of our communities in just getting basic health care. And what about family? It's really interesting that we... Um, we have a, a child protection system, which is really important. I'm not against children being removed if they need to because of safety. But what a lot of people told us, and we saw a lot of people in the Royal Commission who were in the out-of-home care system, what a lot of people told us was that at the end of that journey through out-of-home care, they ultimately went back to find family. Because family is actually enduring, and it is something that we all want a connection to. So do we do, we do enough to support families to be loving like this, to be able to nurture their children well. If we've systematically dismantled Aboriginal families over generations, what have we done to systematically put that back together or help them to reclaim those cultural practices that were so good for children? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But family is absolutely essential if we're going to bring about the well-being of our children. So if we look at Aboriginal kids in general, do Aboriginal kids get an Aboriginal childhood? What do you think? Some do, but a lot don't. And if you certainly look at a lot of our kids that are in out-of-home care or in the juvenile justice system, they miss out. I remember having a little boy in clinic once, and I had an Aboriginal flag sticker on my table, and he said, that's my country. I said, yeah, that's right. I said, do you know where your country is? Do you know who, which mob you belong to? He said no. He had no idea about his heritage or his identity or anything cultural. But he knew that that sticker somehow represented him. And we, we, we don't have many representations of Aboriginal children in society. In fact, one of our earlier speakers put up the, the lack of representation of multicultural Australia within society. Well, it's still the same for our mob as well. Do Aboriginal children have a right to history? 
do they get to hear about what happened so that they can have a context for understanding perhaps some of the reasons why their family or community is in the state it's in. I don't think we always teach it very well. Do they have a right to recovery and healing? We have some amazing healing practices in Indigenous society that don't get recognised. It's all put down to sort of myth or mythology or legend or whatever. But we actually have some very, very good, uh, well thought out and um, very expert ways of providing a healing for children and for adults and for old people that goes completely unrecognised. Do children have a right to self-determination? Self-determination seems like it's only a bad word when you put it to the Aboriginal context. Everyone else can have it except us somehow. And it's hard to have an individual capacity of a self-determination if you don't see it in your community or in your parents or in the adults around you. When you're kept in a situation of dependency or powerlessness, it's hard for children to exercise that right to self-determination. And do Aboriginal children, children have a right to their own story, to the right story, to start off the right way in life and to be able to live out the story as it should be? Some of the Aboriginal people I saw from Missions and Stolen Gen said they were, they were given the wrong story. That wasn't meant to be their story. And they now have to rewrite that for themselves. So what's an Aboriginal birthright? If you're born into a culture and a group, then it gives you a sense of who you are, who you belong to, your country that you're born from, your belief systems and your values, and it gives you meaning. For a lot of the Aboriginal kids I saw in services, they were very displaced. They were caught between two worlds. They weren't black, they weren't white, they didn't know who they were, and they didn't know how to be in the world. They also couldn't explain some of their cultural experiences because they had no frame of reference. So they were just lost. They were just completely lost. If we look at kinship and attachment, for example, we had the safest kinship system in the world. Bowlby would have been very proud of us. You couldn't be an orphan in Aboriginal society. There was no such concept. Kinship and attachment was very broad. You had lots of mothers, you had lots of fathers, you had lots of grandmothers and lots of grandfathers, and it was reciprocal. So as you became an old person, you became someone's daughter or someone's son, and they had that responsibility then to make sure that you were okay. So it was a very broad attachment system and it also at attached you to nature, to a totem, to your country, to special places. We also have spiritual and cultural determinants in development, not just social determinants. There's so much emphasis on dealing with poverty and disadvantage and employment and then we forget about identity and meaning and development of emotion that's based on those spiritual and cultural determinants. It's important to know who you are and where you've come from. It's important to have a culture and an identity that's linked to where you're born from. You've got to have pride and purpose and place. And it's really lovely to have this sense of continuity of existence. I know one of the times when I went back to country as a, as a young woman, Standing on the land of my ancestors was a profoundly moving experience. To think that all my ancestors had been here made me feel good. It gave me great, a great sense of well-being and a great sense of pride as well. So if we look at the right to history, it's important that we allow children, particularly Aboriginal children, but also non-Aboriginal children, to know about our culture, that we are the oldest enduring culture in the world. It's not just about historical trauma, but that's important as well. If we think about our education system, do we teach Indigenous history well? What does everyone think? When my mum, my mum's 91, she lives with me. She probably should have died years ago, but she's just so, so angry, she's not going to die. <laughs> um, but she often used to do sort of cultural education in schools and they always said to her, well, no, we don't want any of that history stuff. We don't want you talking about any, any negative... We don't want you talking about stolen generation. We just want the warm, fuzzy stuff. That's not education. I mean, that's good too because it's really nice to have that, some of that cultural stuff. But we've got to teach real history. I've taught for a long time at university um, in medicine and it's really variable what students come to university with. Some, sometimes they come with, with really good knowledge and understanding of what happened, and some come with virtually nothing, and some come with very stereotypical and prejudiced views. 
isn't it about time we got this right? Come on, guys. You know, let's have an education revolution and just say, I'm not, I'm, I'm not looking at blame or guilt or shame. It's just history. Let's just teach it properly so we can get past it and get on with it. Because I think it's really important, and it's important for our kids to know that that's why their families are in the state they're in. And also, I think, for, for the rest of Australia to know what happened in this country as well. Because the past is in the present. History doesn't go away. We have this transgenerational trauma burden now. We have very few sort of, well, I shouldn't say role models. Apparently, that's an overused term. <laughs> but if you think about representations for Aboriginal kids in society today, what are they? Football? Look, I was a slow runner. That's, that's not a good role model for me. You know, but we need to have more. You know, we, we need to have those representations so our kids can aspire to do anything, to be anything. I ran a centre at the University of WA for a long time to get medical students, Aboriginal medical students, through university and, and out into the community as doctors. It's been incredibly successful. It's, it's a really big success story. Right, right. In fact, a lot of the medical schools have done that now and we have a lot of Aboriginal doctors around. We don't really get to hear about that very often, do we? We don't get to really hear about many of those success stories. We either hear the negatives or we hear about football. It's about time we sort of uh, did a little bit better than that. We have a lot of unfinished business. Do you remember when there was the build-up to the apology for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Do you remember that? I can remember um, having an Aboriginal kid in clinic who'd been beaten up in the playground because these kids had said to, said to this uh, little kid, you're going to steal my backyard if we say sorry. That's the level it had got to. There was so much misunderstanding and propaganda that went around. What happened after Rudd did the apology? Was there any great, great catastrophe? No. In fact, it was really well received and I thought it was actually well done. My mother spent three days crying before the apology. But she was very pleased with how it was done. So I think we have to get past some of this stuff and just deal with it in a pragmatic sense, pragmatic sense so that it doesn't become a barrier or a burden to going forward. We're now in a really critical point because we're going to have this whole issue and debate, probably now with the, uh, the new government coming back in, around sovereignty. Are we going to have treaty? Are we going to have constitutional recognition? Where are you going to sit on that? These are going to be critical issues going forward. I don't want to see that same gutter debate we had last time, like we had over the apology. It was really harmful, really harmful. So if we're going to have a debate this time going forward, let's make sure it's a positive one and it's based on, on, on a true sense of what's required as opposed to myth and misunderstanding. And we still have a lot of ac uh, problems with uh, uh, access to services. We still have a lot of racism. In fact, I think a lot of people don't even realise how racist some of our institutions of care are because that's what they were founded on. And some of them haven't changed their practice a whole lot. I mean, really need to have a good look at the way services are delivered in regard to that. We still have racism in regard to health and justice. Um, and a lot of other services as well. And there's still, I think, um, a lot of myth or misunderstanding around who's Aboriginal in this country now and who's not. One of my medical students that I had some years ago got so sick of other medical students saying to her, which part of you is Aboriginal? So she said, my left foot. <laughs> See, it's quite brown compared to the other one. Now let's, let's get past all this stuff. So we've had many successes. You know, we, we really have. We've had the rise of Indigenous professionals. And I just heard from someone in the audience, in fact, he's just sitting there, that you're on, you're on the board of a PHN, is that right? Yay! Because when we were having that, listening to that talk about meritocracy, I don't know how many times people have said to me, Helen, you have to understand, these board positions are based on merit. I'm a doctor, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a professor, I've been a Royal Commissioner, and you're telling me there's not enough Aboriginal people in this country that could do a board position based on merit? I also said to them, what about your merit? 
people working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Do you have any? <laughs> we're doing a lot better in education than we were years ago, but still not good enough. So we're still getting students at the university who wouldn't have got into their tertiary courses based on their year 12 exit marks. But with bridging, they do really, really well. So we're still failing to some degree in education. Do we just not know how to do it? Do we not bother? Or do we still have low expectations that we're not going to achieve very well? And let's have a look at things like reports, recommendations. Um, how many reports have sat on the shelves? How many recommendations have actually gone ahead? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but I've been involved in a lot of policy writing over recent years. I feel like I just keep writing the same policy because it doesn't really get implemented. Now, I'm going to have to speed up because I want to tell you the story at the end. So we should have the right to recovery as well. We are, we are not recovering from transgenerational trauma. We are recovering from generations of trauma imposed on us. It hasn't been transmitted by us deliberately. It's occurred to us. And so we are healing from genocide. And we have to have restorations within and over generations. If we look at a rights-based approach, we know that health and human rights are linked. If we look at Indigenous rights, we know that we should have the right to transmit our culture to our children and that our children should be able to enjoy their culture and language. How many schools teach Aboriginal languages in this country? Probably not many. Some do. Some, some are fantastic. Um, and certainly some of the remote ones, um, they, they really have take pride in language. If we lose Indigenous languages, which we are losing at a rate of knots, they don't exist anywhere else in the world. So they're, they're lost once they've gone. So there was this thing that came out a few years ago, back in 2002, which was a, uh, called the world, A World Fit For Us, which was the children's statement, and it followed up with A World Fit For Children. And I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of lines. This, this was the, from the children themselves. We are not expenses, we are investments. And you call us the future, but we are also the present. I think that's really quite profound from a group of children, isn't it? Because we do talk about children being our future, but then we just ignore them till they're in trouble, and then we try and do something about it. So is a world fit for children also talks about putting children first. Wouldn't it be great if we thought about any policy or any program, what the impact on the child would be or the impact on the family would be, rather than the impact on economic benefit? So I think Aboriginal children need an Aboriginal childhood. It's absolutely essential, particularly if we're going to safeguard this land and this country for future generations, because they are going to be the future custodians. They are going to be the people that do your welcome to country so that you have safe passage when you travel around. They are going to be the ones that know the creation stories and the special parts of country. It's really important that we ensure their right to an Aboriginal childhood. And an Aboriginal Australia fit for uh, an Australia fit for Aboriginal children has to include all of these sorts of things. But in the because I'm going to run out of time, I'm going to move on to a story that I want to tell you. Part of um, working at the Royal Commission, given that it was a very traumatic experience, I started writing children's stories. So I wrote a series of stories called Bushmob, and I'm going to read you one of those stories because I think it just fits in with the mess, final message that I want to leave. It's called Cockatoo Wars, and you'll have to indulge me because I did all these illustrations on the plane. The black and white cockatoo clans had been fighting for such a long time, no one could remember when or how it all started. The fight was the same, though. Who was responsible for looking after the ancient forest? The cockatoo nesting trees were situated across the south side of the forest, and they had been nesting in these trees since the beginning of time. All of Bushmob and the cockatoos knew how important the ancient forest was. It was the beginning of creation and held within it great knowledge, stories and healing. The knowledge was handed down through the generations and it was everybody's responsibility to care for the forest. Everyone has stopped going to the ancient forest as they couldn't get past the fighting cockatoos. You can imagine how loud it was too. Instead of looking after the forest, the cockatoos spent their time fighting over it. Over time, the fighting had gotten worse. Now the black boss cocky and the white boss cocky were fighting day and night. There was no peace anywhere. 
The young chicks in their nests were very stressed and not growing well. Some had lost all of their feathers. One day, the two boss cockies were fighting so much, the trees were shaking, and the two baby cockatoos fell from their nests. One black cockatoo baby and one white cockatoo baby. They landed side by side on the ground. The two mothers immediately flew down to rescue their babies. Because the, both the babies had lost their feathers, they looked the same. The two mothers could not tell them apart. The two mothers decided there was only one solution. They would rear the children together until it was clear who was who. They snuck away to the other side of the forest where no one would find them. <coughs> Being on the other side of the forest was peaceful and the mothers and babies thrived. It wasn't long before the baby's feathers started to grow, but the mothers didn't want to go back to all that fighting. Instead, they decided to raise the babies in the, as brothers in the forest together. They spent many happy times together in the forest, teaching and learning all of the stories about how to care and understand the forest and all its gifts. Being on the other side of the... Uh, sorry. One day, they were visited by the eagle who lived at the edge of the desert to warn them of a large fire that was rapidly approaching. There was a break, no fire break anymore because the ancient forest had been neglected. In their conflict, the boss cockies had forgotten what was important and how to protect the forest. The four cockatoos knew what was at stake and flew back to get help. The two boss cockies were still fighting and wouldn't listen. In desperation, the four cockatoos went to bush mob council to warn them about the fire. Everybody responded immediately. They had to stop the fire before it reached the ancient forest or all could be lost. They quickly came up with a plan. Some of the older bush mob had been in fires before. They knew that the bark of the paperbark tree could slow the fire down and make bags to hold water. But they needed big flocks of birds to carry the water bombs. And of course, the largest clans were the black and white cockatoos. The two boys raised together were now fully grown. They knew the boss cockies would not agree to work together. The two brothers decided with their mothers that they would lead the clans. The four cockatoos returned to the nesting trees and everyone was so happy to see them return. They were surprised at how big and strong they had grown, and they were bigger than most of the other birds in the flock. The mothers told them how peaceful it was living on the other side of the forest, and how the forest had helped them grow strong. They asked for the, the cockatoo's help to fight the fire. In the meantime, everyone had gathered at the billabong. They soon had a stockpile of water bombs, bombs for the birds to carry. The larger birds started ferrying the water bombs, but they were so few in number, they really needed the cockatoo's. All of a sudden, the sky was covered with black and white cockatoos led by the cockatoo brothers. Everyone worked as hard as, and as fast as they could. Flocks of cockatoos flew over the fire and the forest, releasing the water bombs. The two boss cockies heard the commotion and looked up to see the fire. They were missing the most important job of their life. By this time, a large cloud of thick black smoke and ash had formed near the cockatoo's home. There was no going around it. The boss cockies were going to have to fly straight through it. Burning embers landed on their wings, burning some of their flying feathers. They only managed to find their way through the fire by flying together. With everyone working together, they put out the fire and saved the forest. As the black and white cockatoos flew back to the billabong, they saw the two boss cockies standing face to face at the water's edge. They were really worried they were going to have another fight. The two boss cockies had realised how foolish they were. They agreed they would never fight again. Instead, they would look after the forest together. Even though the fire was over, a thick grey ash fell like snowflakes all over the ground, covering everything. The two boss cockies burst out laughing. There was no black or white cockatoo now. They were all grey. A great celebration ensued. From then on, everyone was taught the stories of the forest and followed the wisdom passed down through the generations. Everyone started visiting the forest again. It made them feel good and kept them strong. One beautiful sunset sometime later, the bush mob and the kangaroo, the cockatoo clans had a healing ceremony in the forest. They remembered the story of the fire. They promised they would never forget and look after the ancient forest forevermore. The cockatoo clans were happy. Bush mob were happy. The children thrived and so did the forest. I'm nearly finished. I think it's really easy to forget what's important and fight for the wrong things. Sometimes we just fight for the sake of fighting. No one has the higher moral ground when it comes to looking after children and country. We all have a role and responsibility in this. We have to look after our country and our children for our nat nation, nation to have a future. At the end of the day, we have a shared humanity. We mostly want the same things, to bring about the well-being of our children and our nation. 
given the magnitude of what happened in this country um, and what we have done to generations of children, we need the courage to commit to sustainable generational healing. Who is going to make sure that our children are held within the mind, the heart and spirit of family, culture, community and society in the right relationships with those positive images that they can look up to and aspire to? Who is going to give them the right story, not the wrong one that they're currently in at the moment? We must all take responsibility to raise children well so that maybe one day we can tell this story. Once upon a time, there was a place where children were loved and safe to grow up as they should. Happy, healthy, free to dread dreams and achieve brilliance. Thank you.